be sure. Stay tuned to PBS 39 as we go full steam ahead to explore the fields of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. You've heard of Apple Watch and Fitbit, but now there's some new innovators in town. Local Bethlehem students turn wearable technology into fashion with help from the Da Vinci Science Center. Meanwhile, educators at the Science Center partner with Cedar Crest College to promote science careers to young women. These stories, plus a local ceramics artist using physics, chemistry, and geometry as we go full steam ahead on Focus. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest, Banking Insurance Investments, Fellowship Community, Continuing Care with Spirit, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lara McHugh, broadcasting from the PPL Public Media Center at PBS 39. This month, we're going full steam ahead on Focus to explore science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, the core areas covered by the Da Vinci Science Center in Allentown. We begin our coverage with a focus on technology with reporter Brittany Garzillo. Brittany? Thanks, Laura. Well, you've probably heard of Apple Watch and Fitbit, but we have some new innovators in town. I spent the afternoon at a local middle school where sixth grade students tried their hands at creating wearable technology. Take a look. Inside classroom 404 at Brockle Middle School in South Bethlehem, students have wearable technology at and on their fingertips. Some of our students that don't typically learn from pencil and paper, this is a way for them to shine. These sixth grade students shine bright because of a new program offered through the Da Vinci Science Center in Allentown called the Da Vinci STEAM Makerspace. A makerspace is a project-based environment in which the kids get to form their own ideas about the project and where it's going to end up. So you got to think about how you're going to wear it too. Steve McGorry, the Outreach Education Manager at the Da Vinci Science Center, works side by side with students to help them design and create personalized articles of clothing like hats, socks, and gloves that light up. The ultimate goal of the program is to get students to see how different aspects of technology can relate to various subjects, and in this case it's art, science, engineering and involves the topic of electricity as students learned the science behind circuitry. Yeah, LED lights, right. They learned right, science yeah. behind what makes up a battery and from there they use those skills to use wires, batteries, and lights to build circuit. Once they learned how to make a circuit using batteries and lights, they then also learned how to sew. With a needle and thread in hand, students carefully stitch electroluminescent wire, often known as EL wire, into place. I had to sew it onto the glove. I made a hat and it's the word wolf with a heart. A battery pack powers the EL wire and when the overhead lights are turned off, with the push of a button, their colorful designs virtually come to life. The program is supported by a grant from the Lehigh Valley Community Foundation and has tested student skills beyond STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Your leadership skills, definitely your skills to be keeping your idea going and to be creative. Creativity, not giving up. So it's really brought about some leadership roles in students that normally are not leaders in our classrooms. Since the start of the program in October of 2015, Newhart says she's seen academic improvement in some students. They were maybe struggling prior to the program, but their grades have improved greatly. So this is an overexposure light picture that one of the kids actually just created on spot here. 
We really want it to be a, a fun and integrative experience, something that they remember the rest of their lives. And perhaps a way to inspire the future generation of innovators to discover their own bright ideas. The EL wire used in the student projects is the same type used in productions by Lightwire Theater, an internationally recognized theater troupe known for their electroluminescent artistry. Students plan to present their finished pieces during Lightwire Theater's show called Moon Mouse, A Space Odyssey at the Zollner Arts Center at Lehigh University in Bethlehem. Thank you so much, Brittany. We'll now focus on another Da Vinci Science Center program that aims to address the critical shortage of scientists and engineers entering the workforce. For more, here's Focus reporter Grover Silcox. Thanks, Laura. Women serve as a vast resource, but they are underrepresented in the sciences. Historically, society has sent girls the message that science and math are for boys. Research shows that perception has discouraged women from pursuing careers in the STEM fields. The Da Vinci Science Center and its partners in the Lehigh Valley are one of many organizations now encouraging girls to pursue careers in science and engineering. The Da Vinci Science Center wants girls to know that they can pursue an exciting, successful, and rewarding career in science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM fields, the same way boys can. So welcome, you guys. This session, we're going to talk about DNA. Uh, so I was here doing a DNA workshop with the Da Vinci Science Center, uh, promoting women in science, trying to get the students engaged in science and really thinking about science for their future careers. I'm a biology professor. I teach molecular genetics, and basically that means DNA biology. So I study DNA. What does DNA do? Who can tell me what DNA does? The Da Vinci Science Center invited female scientists and professors to lead hands-on science activities as part of the center's WISE Women in Science and Engineering initiative. In this classroom, Dr. Joy Carnes, chair of the biology department at Cedar Crest College, teaches sixth graders how to extract their own DNA with Gatorade and some basic lab equipment. We're going to come around with little cups. We're going to swish for a minute and spit it back into the cup. Ready, set... Go! We're promoting women in science because women still do not hold as many uh, executive positions as men do, especially in science. Everybody very gently, upside down, right side up. We're not shaking, we're just mixing very gently. Oftentimes women are told that well, math is for boys. According to studies cited on the American Association of University Women website, women represent less than a quarter of the workforce in STEM fields. We really think it's important that women understand that they can be scientists. Research shows that girls often veer away from STEM fields because of the perception that STEM fields are for males only. It's that perception that the Da Vinci Science Center and its partners are trying to change. I found it interesting because I never did my DNA before. The instructor was amazing. I got to understand everything she was saying while leading the kids through the process. Dr. Karnas serves as a role model who demonstrates that women can achieve successful careers in science. I enjoy doing these outreach activities because you get to see this whole age spectrum. You see the, the younger kids who are interested in science and try to get them thinking about what could you do when you get to be a college student. Other students learned about fingerprinting from Cedar Crest College forensic science majors. We're gonna take these invisible ink pads here. We're going to rub our fingers on it, and then we're going to put our finger in the appropriate box. In another room at the center, Dr. Audrey Ettinger, a neuroscientist from Cedar Crest College, showed the kids what real brains look like. And the kids are getting a chance to put on gloves and actually touch a real brain, which is very exciting for them. <laughs> it's really important that girls enjoy science as much as boys, and that everybody gets a chance to, to have the, the fun that I do in working in this field. We always are looking for the most innovative solution. The Da Vinci Science Center followed up the workshops two days later with a public panel discussion in which six highly successful female executives in STEM fields from aerospace engineering to chemistry spoke about their careers and answered questions from audience members. We really felt that what I learned in engineering school was how to solve problems. 
that you know the problem solving can take on a wide variety of different areas and aspects and difficulty but what engineering school teaches you is a very methodical disciplined approach to solving problems and that one of the panelists Helen Coleman an engineer by profession retired as the first female chairman and CEO of the DuPont company the world has a lot of issues today in engineering and science can very often help solve those problems. So we need more young people going into the sciences and engineering. We need more women going into the sciences and engineering. The world urgently needs more scientists and engineers to solve complex problems, from tackling climate change to curing cancer. The Da Vinci Center and its partners believe that bright young women can fill that need, and encouraging them in that direction is the wise thing to do. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thank you, Grover. That panel also included women leaders from IBM, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and Merck Research Laboratories. Studies show that women in STEM fields like these make 33% more than women working in other industries. To learn more about the issue, the head of the Da Vinci Science Center recently joined me in the studio. Our guest now is a leader in the field of science and technology education. Lynn Erickson is the executive director and CEO of the Da Vinci Science Center in Allentown. Welcome to Focus. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. When we look at statistics from the National Science Foundation, they report that women remain underrepresented in fields of science and engineering, yet we are doing better and it's to a lesser extent than they were in the past. What is driving uh, lower rates in women in these fields? I think there are a number of factors. I mean, we know, for example, women make up 48% of the workforce, but they only make up 24% of the STEM workforce. But it varies by field. So in the medical areas, the biology areas, uh, there's much more equity. But in the physical sciences, and especially in computer science and engineering, uh, there's not. And in fact, computer science, over the last couple decades, the percentage of women has gone down, and engineering has been flat for like 30 years. So um, that begs the question about, you know, what can we be doing and what's causing, as you suggest, what's causing some of that? And I think it's a variety of different things. I think that girls are socialized from a young age um, not to pursue those particular areas. And also, it's, you know, there's two parts of it. So one part of it is that and how we encourage girls to pursue the math and science areas. And then I think the other part uh, has to do with how, once they pursue those areas, how we support them, whether it be in college or in jobs afterwards. Um, we know, and this is all research-based, there's a wonderful study out recently, last spring, by the American Association of University Women called Changing the Equation, and it talks about a lot of the research around these issues, and um, I think there are a number of factors. I think that girls sometimes perceive that the the field is, you know, boring, you're isolated, you're in a lab by yourself all the time, hmm. there's not a lot of opportunity for social interaction. They sometimes perceive that um, um, it, it's, uh, girls want to contribute to service. They want to give back to the world and make a difference in the world. And again, they see that as very isolated and not making a difference in the world, where it's exactly the opposite. You know, the truth is the opportunities you have as a scientist or engineer whether it's designing new products that might influence energy in a lesser developed country or in our own country, or addressing climate change or developing a cure for the Zika virus, right, or the cancer, uh, or cancer, there's enormous opportunities to making the world a better place. Engineering, developing new materials that can be used um, on and sensing devices that might be used on cars. We hear about sensing devices on cars now, we're gonna have driverless cars. There's so many opportunities to really give back and make a difference. And we know from research that girls are especially interested in making a difference. I'm not saying that guys aren't, but girls are especially interested in making a difference. And the engineering and sciences offer a lot of those opportunities. Um, so one thing is about the, the field and understanding the field and what opportunities it offers. Um, I think one area is about biases. So unfortunately there are biases just in general as girls are growing up, uh, their teachers, um, as they go into colleges, even at once they're employed, there are stereotypes and biases that men are more um, suitable for those fields. Still today in 2016? Still today. 
still today. Even at, there are studies that show, for example, even on a college campus, you think of college campuses as more liberal. Um, if you have two faculty, uh, a male and a female, equally qualified applying for an engineering position, the male's going to get selected. So, it, and it surprises me. I'm surprised too. I'm thinking we were talking about this when I was younger, much younger, and we still haven't, you know, kind of addressed um, some of these biases. I think girls um, will get into a science field, and a couple of the panelists gave examples of where they had failed a calculus class. Hmm. or you know, just really struggled their freshman year in college. And very often what happens is they just say, this isn't for me, I'm not gonna do it. And guys are less apt to do that, so we have to provide the support because in, in two examples, two women specifically gave examples of they persevered, they got through it. In some cases they had to take the class a few times or their high school experience maybe wasn't as strong as their peers when they got into college. You know, They weren't doing well. Um, but they persevered, and there was very often someone there, you know, kind of encouraging them. So when we look at causes, now what can we do to look at solutions? What is being done both regionally and at the university levels uh, to address these uh, gaps in the workforce? Well, I think there are increasing numbers of programs, both locally and nationally, to focus on girls in STEM. Certainly you hear in the news all the time, the big companies, the Google and Amazon, you know, the percentage of women they have is very small and they are being really encouraged um, to hire more women, but they've got to have a bigger, you know, kind of pool. So there are a number of initiatives at science centers, like the Da Vinci Science Center in the Girl Scouts has a big, you know, STEM initiative. Um, the YWCA, you know, has a tech girls program. So there are a number of initiatives with organizations that are committed to developing women that are really encouraging, you know, that STEM focus. I would say that mentoring is a really big part of it and role models are a really big part of it. And that's what was happening at this um, uh, Women in Science and Engineering Forum we had. We had uh, dinner beforehand and you got to spend the evening if you were a high school student or college student with college faculty, local STEM professionals from companies uh, that are working in engineering or they're working in research or they're working at the local hospital and they're doctors or, or whatever field they might be in. And we got to spend an hour and a half just talking. You know, how did, how did you, you know, the kids asking, well, what made you decide to go into that? Was it hard? What do you do now in your job? Um, how do you balance? How's the work-life balance? Did you have to give up things? So having the opportunity for those conversations so that women can support one another um, through the pipeline, but also just in general support one another. Uh, so I think that kind of uh, activity, so that was dinner, and then after dinner we had this panel, which was open to all those folks that were at dinner, plus other, uh, other folks. There were a few men in the audience, but not too many. But it was mostly female professionals and high school and college students and faculty. And we heard from these panelists, these distinguished leaders at the top of their fields gave um, firsthand stories, real personal stories, which is what we all need to hear about their experience. How did they get there? What was hard? And I think we need those conversations and we need those role models. Lynn Erickson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. The woman featured in our next story may not work in a typical STEM field, yet as a ceramic artist, she uses physics, chemistry, and geometry every day. Physics, as she uses the pottery wheel to form her artwork, chemistry to mix glazes and fire the clay, and geometry to shape and decorate each piece. Here's Deborah Slata, a former mathematics major with a major passion for pottery. Inside this clay studio, adult art students sit hunched over pottery wheels. Mounds of terracotta colored clay spin through their fingertips, methodically taking shape at the touch of their hands. We're going to release. Okay, you see where, where the pressure is coming from. There you go. That's it. Good. Take a break. Instructor Deborah Slata works with each student individually. Let's do it together. Sharing 35 years of experience behind the wheel in a class called Adventures in Clay. When I sit down at the wheel and I start stretching the clay, 
that is something that still thrills me after all these years to feel to actually feel the clay move with your hands and to it's like bringing it to life. A resident artist at the Banana Factory Art Center in South Bethlehem, Deb never planned a career in clay. I've just used math and geometry to more or less create my own language and my own set of designs on the pieces. She earned a degree in math from Moravian College and signs of geometry remain evident in her ceramic artwork. So this particular piece is from 1988 and is one of the first pieces that I actually use tape on. Using a technique called tape resist, Deb forms intricate angular designs on her ceramics. She employs two different firing methods to achieve a variety of looks. The quick heating raku process results in matte finishes, metallic sheens, and crackle designs. Her stoneware pieces, on the other hand, are kiln fired for 10 to 12 hours at more than 2,000 degrees to produce a shiny lacquered look. So you have to have a lot of imagination to envision what your piece will look like once it's been fired because at this point it's um, not at all what it's going to look like. A single pot plate or vase can take weeks from start to finish. While she's mastered advanced techniques, Deb's class caters to both beginners and experienced wheel throwers. Whether or not you've touched clay, it's a great place to get started. And if you have some experience with clay, it's a great place to refine your skills. I have uh, doctors, lawyers, housewives, uh, people who work the road crews. There's no one person who takes this class. So it brings together uh, just a really diverse group of people who share a love of clay. Deb teaches every step in the process. Basically five steps, you have to do centering, which is making the clay round and smooth, then you make an opening with your thumbs, then you expand the inside of the pot, then you stretch and thin the walls, and then finally shape. After it's shaped on the wheel, each piece dries and fires in the kiln. Next, it's time to add color by glazing. I'm gonna get some glaze, pour the glaze into the pot, and then we're gonna spin and turn to coat the inside. Once the glaze dries, it's back into the kiln to fire again. When you see a piece, it's just like, oh my God, this is incredible. When you're working with clay, it's all about the touch. How does that clay feel between your fingers? It's like learning a new language, and you converse with the clay via touch. That's how you make the clay take a shape. Inspired, I decided to try it. The first thing you want to do is place the clay on the middle of the wheel fairly forcefully. Excellent. After about 10 minutes and a lot of assistance from Deb, I turned a shapeless lump of clay into a small pot. You proved that anybody really can do this with a great teacher. With a most excellent teacher. <laughs> go, 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 go. Perfect. <laughs> you just have to have the patience and um, practice. It's a lot of practice. Time and practice will, will create positive results. So we taped that segment about a year ago, and it was so much fun to go back and to revisit the pottery wheel. Grover, I have to ask you, did you touch the brains? I didn't touch the brain, but I did, <laughs> did admire you? them. Uh, <laughs> they were sheep brains, I think pig brains, and then they, they, they did have uh, human brain samples. So uh, it, it was, uh, you know, the kids were very excited about uh, handling them, and uh, you know, this is a real brain. So, oh, yeah. and the the doctor, the women scientists that were on hand, were so excited and enthused that you just you felt that excitement yourself. And uh, they are the greatest uh, examples of of why you should get into that career. I thought the same thing. The representatives from Cedar Cross yes. College just really radiated joy. Yes. And I said that, and then of course that turned out to be uh, the one woman's name. That's the right, Dr. Name. Julie Carnes. Absolutely, yeah, she certainly represented her name and her profession very well. And the kids were very excited about the, uh, the activity. And you know who else radi radiated joy? All the kids that were in Brockle Middle School, the sixth grade students. I was so impressed, my videographer and I, when we walked in to see these kids sewing. I mean, these are sixth grade students. Some of them had just learned how to sew. Others, um, one specifically that I talked to said he had learned how to sew from his grandmother, so he already knew it. Um, but it was really neat to see them actually, you know, threading pieces of that EL wire together and then um, putting it together in an article of clothing and having something that's wearable. Do you know how to sew? I do know how to sew, yes. I can make basic repairs, what about you? I've sewed buttons on. 
Yeah, that's, that's about, about it. I was yeah. gonna say it's like a hem <laughs> or a button, but I would love to right. learn how to. to I can teach you. It's very useful. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, thank you both. I'm looking forward to seeing what we're working on next week when we continue our series full steam ahead. Until then, remember to focus on what matters. Lunchtime is your time. Time to get inspired. Time to learn something new. Time to travel to exotic lands. Check out Primetime at Lunchtime, weekdays from noon to 2 on PBS 39. You depend on us for inspiring programs you won't find anywhere else. Now you'll see more of the shows you love in the middle of the day. Watch Primetime at Lunchtime on PBS 39. Over a decade ago, my wife and I bought our first house. It was a fixer-upper. As soon as we ran into trouble, which was pretty early on, <laughs> we actually sent a letter to this old house looking for some advice. To my surprise, uh, we got a call saying, hey, we'd like to come out to your house and film a segment for Ask This Old House. So Tom Silva and the crew